Good morning to my old friends and some new friends out there, I would imagine, at Intellus. Richard Vanderveer here. I'm going to be tossing the football back and forth with uh, Sean McDade during the course of this uh, presentation, which really focuses very specifically on the paradigm shift that Heidi just alluded to, really getting the industry to focus much more intently than it has historically on physician and patient CX. A couple points to, to be made there. I, I hope you're going to stay with us. I appreciate you, you setting aside this block of time to be with us. Sean's going to be offering you the, the most practical guidance in this presentation toward the, uh, the presentation end. Uh, but I would like to start out by just sharing the, the, the main message so you know what to expect. I'm going to flick off my video camera here so you can focus on the slides and not on me dancing around. But really, we've got a, a very, very, very uh, important uh, message to share with you today. And it looks like this. It's a, it's a three-parter. Pharmaceutical marketing is currently undergoing the most significant paradigm shift I've ever, ever seen in the, in the field. Sean and I are coming at this from, from very different directions. Sean has spent 20 years of his life or more studying customer CX in, in a number of different industries, in insurance, in uh, hospitality, that's got a lot of learnings to, to be brought into to our party here, um, and increasingly has turned his attention to, to working with patients in hubs, um, and now as the industry is turning to physician CX, working there to, to figure out how to take the principles that he's learned in other industries and bring them into the drug business. That's a, that's a significant paradigm shift. We're hearing terms like physician engagement, people using the, the code term CX. Increasingly in the industry, never really heard that much a year or two ago. That's where we're going. That's what we're going to be talking about today. Patient support services have a great opportunity to move front and center in this endeavor. Um, one of the, the general principles that Sean and I would like to talk about today is the, is the notion of we're going to be defocusing on the molecule um, and, and uh, a product's advantages, its features and benefits up against the competition. We're going to have to take a broader picture than that if we're going to be using uh, customer experience as a competitive advantage, as, as Sean will be talking about. We're going to have to get increasingly serious about customer experience if we're going to bring this off correctly. And I'm going to let Sean, who's the expert on the topic, talk to us about that in just a minute. But first, I'd like to show you the other important slide that, that sets up for the, the message today, and that is this one. Key word that I'd like to share with you today as it relates to customer experience is the word listen. I'm going to have you listen to a few minutes of, of videotapes of, of customers speaking. You know, as an old marketing researcher, we're used to, to saying, uh, asking a question and getting an answer. And increasingly, there's a saying that says, if you ask questions, all you get is answers. If you let customers speak, what you're going to get is insights. So I'm going to let a couple of customers speak to you today. Listen carefully and see what you can derive from the commentary that these folks will offer you. Certain companies have different values that they, they try to um, instill in their reps and how they, they market the drugs. Um, and at first I thought it was individual, but I realized it's the company. Companies have different themes on how they want to do this. Some are just very pushy, very direct and ask you all. So after I presented this, how do you think your prescribing habit will change? I mean, it's almost like you're reading off a script, right? And there's other companies, and again, it's a personal preference, right? They could present to you the drug, the, the data. And they may bring someone who's quite well known. I don't want some local person, right? I mean, uh, you know, I, I if you want to have some authority on the subject, it's helpful to have someone who's considered someone that you listen, you would you would take their input with a little bit more weight and credibility. Um, and I think then it becomes a relationship on how they can support your practice, um, knowing that every drug has its role and recognizing that. You know, I think that the humbleness is that the, if we had a clear one, two, three, four, five, then, you know, you would have already, it's already would be shown in, you know, clinical studies and hence moving over to, I think, the practice pattern. Um, but a lot of this is, you know, like I said, how can they help you help your patients? See how key that word listen is? What you hear this doctor doing is, is a couple of fascinating things. First of all, she's actually thinking about her own customer experience and, and she's she's working through uh, her thought processes as they relate to the customer experience. And I think most tellingly what she's saying is, and this will be a theme that, that Sean and I will be talking about throughout this presentation, help me help my patients is really an integrating concept here 
Um, and, and Sean will tell you why that's important in customer experience right now. Hi, everybody. Sean McDade here. Really great to be here. So yeah, taking up from what Richard just said, she said, help me help my patients. She didn't say, help me help you make quota or help me help you sell more uh, prescription drugs, right? She is focused on the patient. And with customer experience and why it's so important is the customer becomes the center of your business. And here's just some examples. We all know these companies are customer experience leaders, companies like Amazon, companies like Zoom, Netflix, right? So there are these different Slack. Why are these customer experience leaders? Because they've embraced the fundamental tenet of, of customer experience. And that is a frictionless, easy customer experience that you can get done tasks that, you, that used to take a lot of time very quickly and easily. And while you may have a love or hate relationship with some of these, it's hard to deny the fact that they've revolutionized industries and they've put the customer as the center of their business. And we've seen kind of an evolution in, from the 70s where we had a product oriented um, focus to all the way today, we have a customer and now experience centric focus. And that's really where the competitive advantage is. And I know these are non-pharma examples and I'm using them um, for a reason because it's, hard, it's helpful to, to kind of anchor yourself in terms of what others are doing. And customer experience pays. So it's not like it's some like altruistic mission to just focus on the customer and make it easier for them. These companies outperform companies who are not doing the customer experience well. And here's a study that clearly shows that CX leaders in terms of stock market performance were outperforming those who were not leaders and certainly the averages. But the question is, okay, what is the customer experience? Like, how can we define it? And there's a lot of definitions and we have one here that you can read, but let me just explain it. It's about when your customers interact with you, no matter what touch point, no matter what channel, whether it's on the phone, whether it's on your website, whether it's in person, it's the feelings they get via each and every interaction. And their experience is each one of those interactions. And then they have a cumulative experience they have with you that makes up how they think of you as a product, brand, or company. The question is, what is CX in pharma? Now, that is a really good question because, you know, as we know in this industry, uh, doctors don't have, does not, they don't have loyalty to companies, it's prescribing products. So there's this kind of interaction between, you know, how can you have loyalty or experience around a company? It's really tough. It's really experience prescribing specific drugs, specific products. And it's the same with the patients. The patients don't care if Pfizer necessarily is developing a product. They're concerned about that product working for their situation. And that's why it also provides a challenge if, you, if anybody's in the CX industry knows that this net promoter score is kind of the holy grail of questions for lack of a better word, right? It's, the, it's a question that asks, would you recommend the company to a friend or family member? Uh, those who say very likely nines and tens are subtracted from those who say very unlikely zero to six and you get a net promoter score. But it's hard to see how this works in the pharmaceutical industry, right? You can't ask patients whether they would recommend a drug, say for a rare disease that they have. And you really can't ask physicians to, to recommend a drug that's very specific for a patient that they're treating. So this is one reason why it's kind of a little different in pharma and there's a lot of other reasons. But this is why the ultimate question as they call that promoter score needs to be really thought through and developed in the context of physician and pharma CX as we call it. And we're working on that. Here's the bottom line. From the experience I have, the pharmaceutical industry is behind, way behind other verticals around the customer experience, but this is also a huge opportunity. That's the way I look at this. And this is really why they're behind. You have a unique situation where your physicians and their patients, they need your products, sometimes to live. So it becomes tempting just to focus on the product. Hence, that's where a lot of the marketing efforts have gone, right? Scientific features, benefits versus the competition, sales development representatives, if we have in the next slide, you know, calling on physicians from a push perspective, 
you know, talking about that, direct advertising with patients. And frankly, the pharmaceutical industry, for the most part, outside of our clients and some others, have not really done systematic listening to patients and physicians about their true feelings around promotions or however they interact with the pharmaceutical company in a consistent, systematic way, like they're doing in other industries that focus on customer experience. And listen, we know that there's differences, there's regulatory barriers, there's all that, but you know what isn't different? The need for a frictionless experience as easy as possible and being empathetic in how you interact with the customer. Those are core tenets of CX and that's something that the pharmaceutical industry absolutely can extend um, and, and serve their, their customers better. So we're behind, Sean's pointing out very correctly and very distinctly, we are behind and we're starting to pay the price. Um, increasingly, the old model is breaking down. The pandemic simply hastened a trend that, that has been seen over recent years. The, the old promotional model of, of uh, reach times frequency, you hold my hit of kind of remote promotion is breaking down big time. I can show um, numerous slides that indicate the following. Pharmaceutical sales representatives access to doctors continues to plummet. Why? Doctors aren't really interested in speaking with representatives anymore in many cases. Not in all cases, mercifully, but we are seeing a situation increasingly where doctors are, are less than interested, as you can see here, in participating in interactions, be they uh, real or live or virtual, with, with our representatives. We'll see why as we progress through this presentation. There are actually organizations out there like No Advertising Please that if a doctor uh, signs up and swears that he will not allow representatives into his office, he can actually get this, this um, poster to put up in the office to keep representatives away. Many of the businesses that Sean has dealt with in, in terms of, of customer experience worry about what is called churn. Um, customers leaving slowly but surely, sort of oozing out the side, if you will, of the, the marketing transaction. Here we're talking about a, an act of blocking, if you will, which is very unusual in a customer experience situation. Just so, we've actually got organized groups, um, practices and hospitals that are, that are owned by health systems that are in, in the majority of cases now uh, banning representatives a movement in that direction is rather consistent and very worrisome. I'd like to show you uh, about a three minute video. Again, the key word here is listen. I'm gonna ask for your patience and listening to these folks. Here's a doctor, a dermatologist by, by specialty who can very clearly give you some indication as doctors are wont to do if we simply let them talk and we listen in terms of what is working for him, what is not working for him in terms of customer experience. who uh, I, I told, look, and the problem is, you know, they're getting compensated for each visit. That's a check off for them. If they don't do it, they don't get paid. I understand that they have to make a living like everybody else. Um, but so I, I've told them a couple of times, look, you don't have to show up here monthly. You know, uh, you're not telling me anything new every month. Why don't you just come every, they won't do it. You know, and then that, see that from the pharmaceutical company, I, I have some companies, now, on the biologics in particular, I have three different pharmaceutical reps. Mm -hmm. I don't know if their territories overlap. Mm -hmm. Well, that's complete overkill. You know, and they don't really add anything. They don't leave samples of it. They're just back in there to dispense their information. So, I mean, I would say that's kind of a negative. Sometimes I think it's like, you know, overkill. I, I you know, but mm -hmm. I, I appreciate that's the way the fellows get compensated a lot is on the actual you know, visit and checking that off and they got somebody watching them. But that's what I would think is a negative. And that, that one particular example, the guy has repetitively said the same thing pretty much every month for the last couple of years. <laughs> so that doesn't help. And from the standpoint, you know, I'm polite to them and it usually doesn't take more than a couple of minutes. But if I had, I got a negative connotation about that, you know, which I don't think the company likes, <laughs> you know, uh, I mean, I already heard this. What am I stupid? I mean, I have to hear this every month. You know, that's it. So it negatively connotates that particular, you know, company and the type of management they have 
you know, for that for that particular, you know, pharmaceutical rep. I, I think it's just overkill. That's a doctor clearly reporting out the uh, lack of, of satisfaction, if you will, with the the uh, customer experience he's being offered by at least some of the companies that service him. When Heidi gets these the slides out there, you're going to find another slide embedded here, sort of the, the contradistinction to the doctor that you just listened to. I'm going to give you back seven minutes of your, your life by, by skipping over this particular slide and simply saying it's about a specialist. The slide is a conversation that I had with a specialist who is, is the reverse of the doctor you just listened to. She carefully schedules her time with representatives. There's no thing uh, in her practice like a, a drop-by kind of visit, a very different kind of an approach, but it has the same consistency as, as it has a consistency rather with the doctor that you just listened to in that all doctors we find in hundreds of conversations with them want to carefully manage their time. And how do they do that? They've actually developed different personas, different operating styles, different patterns of habits, if you will, that govern the way in which they interact with pharmaceutical companies and their representatives. Real quickly there, and this is a, a cause for another two hour presentation, but different time, different day, different operating styles, different personas that doctors demonstrate all as ways to control their time. One is the open door doctor. You just listen to one of those. He's got his door open. He'll allow a representative in for three or four minutes. And um, that, that happens regularly and to some extent with some dissatisfaction on the part of the doctors that participate in that, in that approach. A catering clinician has, has representatives stop and provide food for the whole practice, uh, a common um, activity as we know. A scheduling specialist is that doctor that I just skipped over who will give the representative quality time, but the representative, if he or she is going to get 10 or 15 minutes of the doctor's time on a schedule, had best be willing, ready, and able to be presenting some new information. We hear when we have conversations with doctors, the terminology update a lot. They are not looking for repetition, as this doctor just said. They are looking for updates in terms of formulary status, in terms of indication, in terms of specific clinical use. That's what the scheduling specialist is interested in hearing in the time slots that you will reserve for representatives. Digital doctor, we're seeing doctors now are actually preferring the opportunity to, to visit with representatives um, via, via Zoom like this or via other um, uh, digital channels. Doctors are moving in that direction because they feel that's a better way to, to control their time. It's not as invasive as having a live person um, stop into their office. And then there's the protected practitioner. That's the doctor who practices in one of those settings that we talked about a few slides ago where the, where the setting basically says, the, the, the institution in which the doctor practices says, don't come to my practice don't come to the uh, this particular institution. We don't have time for it. Very different operating styles that need to be taken into consideration. And when you get these slides, you can study these quotations and get an understanding of, of how these doctors think. Increasingly coming into play, as, as I said a few minutes ago, is a, is a focus on a very interesting interplay between omnichannel marketing, again, terminology that we hear with increasing frequency in recent months and years, and customer experience. If you think about it, there's a circle here. I mean, Sean spoke to the issue of why is customer experience important? And it's getting increasingly important in the pharmaceutical industry because if you think about how omni-channel marketing works, it's got increased use of digital over personal promotion. It's got pull increasingly favored over push. And it provides us with the opportunity to customize, individualize, and personalize. This has got a lot of different special, specific meanings in the pharmaceutical industry. We are relying, if you look at that second bullet point, increasingly on our customers to pull information rather than simply stand still in a you hold them, I hit them environment. We're looking for them to, to pull information. And if they are not having a beneficial, positive customer experience with our company, that pulling is going to stop very, very quickly. So we've got a, a new import being placed on customer experience by dint of the fact that we're moving in the direction, and I think everybody agrees on this, the direction of omni-channel marketing. Those last three words are opportunities and challenges for us as we move into this new arena. These are not, by the way, equivalent words. They, they look equivalent at first blush, but in fact, they're very different. Customize means those personas that we just talked about, going to have to be able to adjust the approach that we take to a particular physician based on his or her habits of engagement with our company. 
we're going to need to individualize. What is this company's uh, product doing in that practice? As the doctor with the Aurora Borealis indicated, she wants the company to respond to the specific needs of her practice. And last but not least is personalized. Study after study indicates that doctors are looking for a, a personal touch when we go to them. They're not looking for something that's machine generated. They're looking for a, a personal touch. And that's going to be increasingly challenging and increasingly important to incorporate in our omnichannel marketing efforts. Goal of omnichannel marketing is a positive customer experience. As I just said, you can flip that slide upside down and say that a, pos a positive customer experience facilitates, enhances, makes increasingly likely the goal of omnichannel marketing being successful in a particular practice. Patient support programs clearly need to be a major part of moving toward omnichannel marketing and toward positive physician CX. And, and Sean will talk as, as we get to the end of this presentation, just how an important bridge, what an important bridge these programs can serve between patient CX and physician CX, because as we've said, and is obvious, we need to take both into, into consideration. These programs need to be a major part of moving toward on the channel marketing, but what we find through conversations with doctors is they are frequently not. PSRs talk about the programs to some extent, but they are de-emphasized compared to product features and benefits. As the one doctor told us, a repetitive story being told about products, features, and benefits, rather than sharing as the, uh, the Aurora Borealis doctor wants us to do, stories of how we can help her, help her patients. Many doctors, by the way, see themselves as having little personal involvement with these uh, programs. You'll, you'll see uh, a dermatologist that we'll listen to in a couple seconds have special people in her office who do nothing but, a special person, an RN by training, who does nothing but coordinate patient participation with these programs. We've got patient navigators, we've got in-house pharmacies. Lots of different folks are being involved in helping doctors get their patients into these programs. I'm going to ask you to, to pay attention, close attention to this, this doctor. Um, this particular video goes on for four or five minutes, but everything that she says is very, very important, and we'll go back and explore that when we're done listening to her. The amount of paperwork that now she is responsible for of denial, more paperwork to try to fight it, so the companies have provided samples of certain drugs that we give to patients that's very helpful. But most of the time, we have to play the game. And the game is, oh, has he tried this ointment? Oh, no, he hasn't. Okay, well, let's prescribe this right away so we could get that on board. And if he fails it after, you know, a month or, or six weeks, up to three months, we'll be able to get the drug. And the patients are, are most of the time aware of this game. Um, the pharmaceutical companies will provide assistance to patients with samples or with the medication, not for free, but if they're having a difficulty, it's called the bridge programs. And those are really great programs that help patients get their medication for, for inexpensive prices or for free for a certain period of time before we could try to get it for them in another manner. It's a drug that's still for psoriasis, and um, they have a wonderful bridge program that can provide the medication for many, many months. I, I don't know if it's up to 12 or, or, lot, or more, but a long time for the patient, and they uh, provide so many samples for us. More than just about any other company, they're always providing samples, and the patient's Really appreciate that. And if you say that, I missed it. Which company is that? Uh, oh, Tesla. We, we'd both have to look it up. Right? Yeah, usually when I deal with physicians, you think in terms of products, not in terms of companies. That's interesting. Okay. I can look that up if you want. No, no, no. I can look. I, I can look. I was just curious. The reason I asked the question, you know, one of the things that I'm trying to find out is the extent to which these programs actually drive prescribing, drive positive perceptions of the company. And certainly not doing the second, but but are, are you more likely to prescribe on Tesla because of the existence of this program? Yes, we know that we're going to get support. That's the key word, support. 
The patient needs support and we need support. We give them a starter pack. It's, it's good for about a month. And sometimes they get the drug in a, in a month, but sometimes the paperwork and the waiting and the faxing and the emailing and, and the forms, it takes longer than that. And they don't have any more and they run out. So how can they get better? Understood. Oh, Tesla is, is the first program you mentioned. Is it your, your favorite program? Is it the program you've got the most patients on? Or why did that, there's always a reason why a doctor mentioned something first. I'm curious why. Because they were the ones that were more innovative and came up with this um, years ago. And a lot of other companies are doing that now, like uh, Eli Lilly. Eli Lilly is doing that for TELPS, which is a biologic drug for psoriasis. Right. And they have been one of the most supportive companies for our patients. Um, again, writing letters, helping us with denials, helping us with the forms. Um, if we have questions, they're always there. If we need a sample right away, they'll come the next day and bring us one. They're, they've been incredible. Are there any drugs that you use where where the, the company trots out a case manager, an RN, uh, anything that uh, is really supportive of the patient of onboarding and adhering? For, for example, a lot of patients have to give themselves injections at home of medication. And they'll say, you know, I'm, I'm scared. I don't know how to do it, what to do. I've never done this before. What do I do? So we send them a link to a page on the website for the patient support program to show them how to do it, a video. So we'll send them a link and they'll click on it and there'll be a three minute or whatever video saying, okay, you know, this step-by-step -step is how you do the injection for this particular drug. Um, patients will call us up about questions for everything, uh, sharp boxes, injection reactions, and we will tell them, okay, go to this link, go to this website, and there's a patient support program. And most of the time we'll give them the phone number to call. Um, we don't see a lot of case managers that often. There's an element of fear. Fear and trepidation, I'm not gonna get my medicine. I'm sick, I have X, Y, and Z problems, and I'm not gonna get my medicines that I need. And that creates fear and some, some sadness, you know, some disappointment, because they're not gonna get what they need. Um, and I can't provide them with the samples that I used to, because they used to love that, they used to last for quite a while. Um, so the unknown, not knowing, am I gonna get it? Or are they gonna deny it? When am I gonna find out? We get so many calls. Did you, did you hear anything yet? Did you, do you know? I'm like, no, we, we're going to let you know. We're going to call you and let you know when it's approved. So there's a lot of, um, unfortunately, there's a lot of calls from patients and emails about that. That's coming into your biological coordinator, if I hear you correctly, not you. I, was, I would hope. Yeah. Good. Well, no, I get the, I, I check the emails multiple times a day. And I get them and I send them to them. Hmm. What you hear there is clearly a love-hate relationship that this doctor has with patient support programs. She needs them. Uh, she's staffed up with a biologics coordinator to make sure her patients have access to them. But, but she's pointing out a lot of the, the challenges that she has in, that her practice has, that her biologics coordinator has in uh, making these programs actually work for patients on a timely basis. What have we learned from this doctor more specifically? She does use patient assistance programs extensively, especially with biologics. She associates programs with products, not with companies. And that's, that's interesting to go back to Sean's commentary about how does customer uh, experience work. Do we want to focus in on, on the, the product or our company as the, um, uh, the experience target for the, for the physician? Application process for assistant programs is high friction. Note that friction word that I'll use, that Sean uses frequently, causing patient anxiety that they won't get their medications. Delays in program administration can actually cause program uh, problems rather in, in treatment. Red tape of the programs is handled by the biologics coordinator. So this doctor has the advantage of at least to some extent having the workload associated with the products distance from her hands. She also uses patient support programs to provide high quality necessary information like how do I do an injection at home? This, this uh, by the way, th th what you just saw was about five minute snippet of um, a 45 minute conversation I had with this physician. Any of you that are interested in the dermatologic area in dermatologists and, and what they are saying in terms of what they want and what they don't want 
in terms of, of uh, a customer experience in general and patient support programs more specifically. Uh, get in contact with me and we'll, we'll get the original 45 minute um, recording out to you so you can listen to, to this Dr. Holdforth um, more extensively on those topics. I'm going to give you back another seven minutes of your time. Here's a, here's a, um, uh, a conversation that I had with a neurologist. Um, this conversation, again, will be embedded in the slides that, that we will be sending to you. And I would encourage you to go back and listen to it so you can contrast what it is that this doctor has to say with what the, uh, the dermatologist just listened to. We learned from this doctor, I can give you sort of the Cliff's Notes version of this. This doctor resents, and I, I should probably have that word in caps or red or something, having to spend time working for free to get patients enrolled in pharmaceutical company programs. He does not have that coordinator that the dermatologist that you just listened to has in, uh, in her practice. So he's got to do the work and he's not happy about it. To avoid wasting time, he is looking for foolproof programs. That's a fun word. And, and again, I would encourage you to go back and listen to the, the snippets in the, in the, uh, in the um, uh, slot embedded in the slides. If again, if you'd like, and you're interested in neurologists, uh, just give us a, a contact and we'll get the whole neurologist tape out to you. Uh, when, he, when he talks about foolproof, he's saying, I don't want a program that's here today and going tomorrow where they change the rules. That's what the doctor means by a foolproof customer experience with these programs. He's more willing to spend time on programs for drugs that really make a difference in patients' lives. If a drug doesn't make a difference, he's not willing to, to jump through the hoops. He believes that these programs should receive more promotional attention. If you listen to the recording, what you'll hear is the doctor say, right now, representatives spend about 20% of their time with him talking about the programs. He thinks it should be more like 80% because he already knows about the products just like that first doctor we listened to, he does not have to hear the same message time and time again. And we have to watch our terminology, this doctor says, because he believes that these programs are designed to sell drugs, nothing more, nothing less. And he really resents it when we use terminology like we want to partner with you in a patient's treatment. He's not buying that for a moment. Bottom line here is that the pharmaceutical industry is going to, to have to learn to design programs and patient, patient assistance programs, patient support programs to produce better physician CX, patient CX, and Sean will explain how that might work. Yeah, I mean, we've talked a lot so far about what customer experience is, you know, the experience that physicians are having, especially in, in, in specialty therapeutic areas. And we've talked, we've heard them say that, you know, so help me support my patient. We've done at People Metrics tens of thousands of interviews via surveys, uh, one on uh, IDIs with patients who have interacted with patient support teams, all of those programs that you just heard. And what we've done is we've created this model, and it's based on the Maslow hierarchy of needs model, where lower level. Um, uh, entities are more important, and until they're satisfied, the higher levels don't matter. So in Maslow, physiological needs was the bottom, the base of the triangle, and those are things like shelter, and then self-esteem and self-actualization um, needs were at the top. So these are patient needs that if pharmaceutical companies can fulfill, they're going to create a great customer experience. And the first, the base, is financial security. Patients want to know, I can afford this medication that was just prescribed to me. And once and only once when they get through that, then they're concerned about some sort of logistical support, such as I know how to get my medication and I can get that in a reasonable time frame. So I can afford it, I know how to get it, and I can get it in a, in a reasonable time frame. And then especially with biologics and for rare disease, it's I either know how to administer this medicine myself or I need I know where to go to administer that medication. So once those three needs are fulfilled, then it goes to general support questions, right? When you get diagnosed, especially with a chronic or rare disease, you want to know about a variety of things before you onboard and, and, and take your first dose, such as where can I travel with this medication? How can I travel with it? Are there any other people like me in my area? Um, and a, a million other questions. They need to feel like they have a support system. So pharmaceutical companies can provide that. 
Then they get to the ultimate need. This is the, this is the self-actualization need in Maslow's hierarchy. It's confidence. Confidence that I am prepared for to begin my treatment. This is a practical way pharmaceutical companies can create a great experience for their patients. And we actually have, PeopleMetrics has questions measuring each one of these dimensions that are benchmarked, et cetera. There's about 15 total. So these are things that we do a lot. This is a practical guide. We've also created the same type of hierarchy for physicians. And you might be saying like, all this physician CX stuff sounds great. What am I supposed to do? Well, this is what you can do. You can measure how well you're delivering these five needs. The base need in this pyramid, and we heard it over and over again in our interviews is therapeutic knowledge. I have everything I need to, I, to know to prescribe the best therapy, therapy for my patients. So this does not mean sales development reps going in and repeating a message that was approved by legal every week for months, like one of those doctors said. This is what the other doctor talked about is bringing in an expert to talk about new formularies, to talk about new research that's going on so they can become as educated as possible with their therapeutic area. Once that's fulfilled, then the focus shifts to patients really clearly. They wanna be able to have the patients get on the medication that they just prescribed. Seamlessly, meaning less friction, as frictionless as possible, and with affordability with any assistance programs that can be provided. Once that happens, they want easy onboarding. Again, you see the words easy, seamless. This is all CX terminology that fits really nicely into the pharma CX world. My patients are easily able to onboard onto prescribed medication as with as little burden as possible to me and my office. Those are four or five key words to me and my office. They want their office as much support as possible so they can focus on things like the next need, patient success. And patient success is simply about having the patient achieve those medical outcomes by staying or adhering to therapy. And the final need that we keep hearing about over and over again is freedom. COVID has changed the world for physicians, especially their experience, frankly, with patients on their job, with pharmaceutical companies. They want as much free time away from the, the, the bureaucracy, away from the paperwork, away from everything else that they may have to deal with to serve their patients to the best of their ability. That's why they got into the, into the uh, profession and if pharmaceutical companies can fulfill these needs for their, their customer, which is the physician, and their other customer, which is the patient, I call them co-customers, it's going to be a much better experience going forward. And what's really interesting is these patient assistance programs and patient support programs can be the bridge between physician and patient needs. And Remember, these are co-customers to pharmaceutical companies, physicians and patients. So let's look at how that might be. So these are the two hierarchy of needs that we just talked about. And let's look at some ways patient support programs and patient services programs can be a bridge to fulfill these needs. So if you remember, patients want financial security at all costs. Physicians want seamless affordability for their patients after the therapeutic knowledge is fulfilled. Well, there's patient assistance programs, there's copay cards, there's a variety of different ways the patient support teams can help patients afford therapy. The second need, if you recall, on the patient side is logistical support. I need to know where to go to get my medication and the physicians want easy onboarding for their patients. Well, there's lots of opportunities for support programs to provide for things like transportation assistance for patients to get to wherever they need to go to get their medication. Remember the third need for patients is medication administration. How do I actually administer this medication? Physicians want easy onboarding. Patient support programs can provide nurse liaisons that go into the home to train patients on how to use the medication. There are hubs, which are basically call centers that are spun up either internally within pharmaceutical companies or within partners that help answer questions around medical administration and some other areas. 
and the and and then we get to the final support system and easy onboarding fits within that as well where we have hubs for rare disease and specialty pharmacy there are case managers that are dedicated to the contact center the call center and patients can literally call the same case manager over and over again and have any of their questions answered they love case managers our data shows case managers especially for biologics make a huge difference in the customer experience and then, of course, digital assets like websites, that's, uh, we heard that from one of the physicians. And finally, doctors want patient success. Patients want confidence to onboard to, into medications, new medications. Patient services can provide assistance on both that link both of those, such as you know, patient ambassadors, patients like you that have the same type of disease and have been on therapy for a while and be able to connect them and just ongoing hub support so you, they can have any questions, patients have any questions answered so they can be successful on their journey and hopefully have a much better quality of life. So hope you're seeing that there's a lot of opportunities, you know, what we're trying to do is tangible opportunities that pharma can do to create better customer experiences. And there's definitely great ways to measure all this, which is really kind of what, what we do. Okay, a hint, let's see the hints. For doctors and patients alike, it's all about reducing time, so making things easy, reducing the hardness in any kind of activity to either onboard into new medication or adhere to it or prescribe it, and then reducing uncertainty in terms of getting on new medication. These are all the tenets of CX in every industry that, that I've worked in. And, and it's true, and we can have another one of these webinars on some differences in pharma versus other industries around CX, but. The point is the needs of the patients are pretty similar and, and physicians. We have a process that I go through in uh, my book that I recently um, released called Pharma Customer Experience where there is this feedback loop that we talk about. And this is a good way I think to think about, you know, how tangibly do we do this? So we start by thinking about how do you create a great experience with intention? Right, so it's creating CX intentionally. So I have this saying that customer experiences happen whether you intentionally create them or not. But the good ones almost all the time are based on something that you created intentionally. When you go to a great restaurant or a great hotel or you have a great online experience, it doesn't happen by accident. There are people thinking about each part of that experience before you even have it. It's the same with these, these um, programs that you're developing for physicians and patients. You know, you can create it intentionally, measure it continuously. That's one difference between pharmaceutical or, or customer experience and market research is in customer experience world, we're measuring, we, we focus on a touch point, a listening post, and we focus on it continuously. So one of the, one of the listening posts we focus on continuously for our clients is the onboarding touch point for patients. That's a very important touch point. And we're measuring the experience they have with patient support services around that touch point continuously. And then not just listening, it's managing that, um, managing those experiences proactively. So if we're seeing that a patient had a poor experience, follow up. If we're seeing lots of patients having a poor experience and it's the same root cause, make a change and then start measuring again. That change is again, a feedback loop. So you're re, you're re kind of creating what the experience will be once you get feedback from your customers. And this is like a fundamental piece that I think applies to any industry and it certainly applies to pharma. As I said, I have a book that I published earlier this year called Pharma Customer Experience. It is available on Amazon if anybody wants to read this book. It has a detailed overview of that patient hierarchy of needs I just went through, including questions that we ask um, in the, for those, those different um, levels available on Amazon. There's also another book that I wrote called Listen or Die, and that's across any industry. If you're interested like in a crash course on best practices in collecting customer feedback and delivering better customer experiences across any industry, you might wanna check that out. And I'm super excited to announce that Richard and I are going to be um, delivering a book called The Psychology of Physician CX sometime next year. 
um, Q1, Q2, and we're super excited to share all the learnings that we have from the many, many conversations that we've been having with physicians around their desired experience with pharmaceutical companies. Thank you for your time. And now we have, I think, some time for questions. Is that right, Heidi? Yes, we do, a few minutes. All right. Um, we, we did have a question come in um, from Bill, going back to that slide that you just covered with the CX loop. Yes. Um, um, so do you envision CX research approaches like satisfaction tracking happening? He gets uh, post-interaction surveys from one of his HCP specialists, but he's never gotten one from a pharma or med device company. Yeah, I mean, I think that it's going to it's going to depend, right? So, you know, we've had Salesforce effectiveness research for a long time around, you know, the effectiveness of the sales force. But what Richard and I are imagining is it's gonna it's gonna need to be broader than that. It's gonna have to be the experience with all touch points that they may have had in a recent period of time. So what we're envisioning is potentially like monthly, quarterly type touch bases with your target physicians around the experience that they've had with you over that period of time. And really getting into what are some of those digital channels they may have interacted with? What, what about the sales force? What about any kind of patient support that they've, they've interacted with, et cetera? Richard, what, what would you add to that? Yeah, I'd add that there are really two very different kinds, very different but related kinds of, of uh, customer experience research that we're involved in. One is post-transactional, if you will, following up on a particular interaction with a particular touch point that, that Sean was just talking about. The other is overall relationship, uh, standing back and not looking at an individual touch point, but, but as that, um, uh, that promoter score uh, question wants to do, explores the overall uh, effect of, of every one of the, the uh, uh, touch points put together. So one of the things that we're going to be um, focusing in on is when to use each of those, and there are very different applications for each of those different kinds of uh, customer experience research. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the things, Richard, we don't want is we don't want to overburden the physician with lots and lots of surveys every time they interact with the pharmaceutical company. I think that's probably defeating the purpose. But with patients who are onboarding onto new therapy, that's an absolutely required, in my opinion, touch point to always get patient feedback in that circumstance, as well as for, for rare disease and biologics, understanding 6, 12, 18 months after onboarding, how are they doing with the product and what are some pain points in terms of maintaining um, and, and adhering to medication. Yeah, so, that's absolutely correct. I've been going back full circle of the presentation and, and making the point that we've made time and time again, doctors are very, very jealous of their time. Yeah. And I'm sure you've had the same consumer experience that I have of you call and, and try to get something done at a, at a mail order pharmacy or something of that nature. And the first thing they say to you before they've helped you with your issue is, would you be willing to stay on the line and take a survey after this in, in terms of how well the customer experience went? That can be very irritating for us. That could be really irritating for physicians if we overdo it. So we're gonna to have to be very judicious in terms of our approach and not over-research, if you will. Um, and then, so do you see CX as being a function that fits into the market research role or should it live somewhere else in the company? That's the million dollar question, Heidi. Um, we're seeing it both ways. We're seeing CX professionals now um, emerging within pharmaceutical companies. Um, market research is always a very key stakeholder at that table, even when that's the case. And I've seen it integrated into the market research programs within therapeutic categories or brands as well. So I think it depends, but I do think it's going to be something that market research folks are going to have to you know, are going to want to keep an eye on, and they can have such great contributions to this, because at the end of the day, there's lots of design, study design and analysis and figuring out insights. That's what this is. It just happens to be like a more continuous effort, and they may, you may be involving more people within your organization than you might do for a market research study. Yeah, Sean's got a very good chart uh, in one of his books it, that relates marketing research to uh, CX research, and shows similarities and, and differences between the, the two, regardless of, of where it lives within a company. And that, that is an important issue, as, as Sean just said. But regardless of where it lives in a particular company, you need to be coordinating your marketing research efforts and your CX efforts to get the optimal result. So coordination, integration, all those good kinds of things are going to be important. I tend to believe, therefore, that it's better to have those under the same roof, under the, under the organizational umbrella, um, but as, as Sean pointed out, that's, that's being um, uh, 
dealt with in, in different ways in different companies. I mean, the other interesting point, Heidi, is that CX naturally has a technology component that distributes, distributes results to lots of stakeholders within an organization. With a lot of market research, rightfully so, you, you could do a study and move it out, run, run tables, go put together a PowerPoint, and the client may never see the, the results online because um, they don't need to. For CX, it, it, it's, it's a living, be breathing thing that usually gets distributed you know, to teams outside the, the, the typical purview of market research. So I think that's one of the differences. But the key thing is the technology is useless without knowing what to ask and knowing what results mean and knowing what actions to take to improve the experience. So it's a true combination of those two that we think makes CX in pharma and any industry pretty successful. An important element of the, the systems that do what Sean was just talking about is is the notion of rectification, if you will. If somebody has had a problem with customer experience in many of the verticals with which we deal, uh, one of the most important functions of the CX system is to feed back to those responsible the, uh, the information about problems so that they can go rectify them. Question as to what that might look like in the pharmaceutical industry is still an open one. Yeah, I mean, we, we handle that on patient side by, you know, we don't use any patient identification. We have a unique code and there's only several, only identifiable people, a handful at the pharmaceutical company that can access it. And that's how we handle kind of that confidentiality piece. But you're right, there are these differences and, you know, adverse event reporting is another huge difference in the pharmaceutical industry where if somebody says something that they had an adverse event to a drug on the patient side, you have to have a really good reporting system on that that you know, cannot be done, frankly, with technology. That has to be humans, and you have to be able to account for that. So there are these little differences, too, that you have to figure out. Um, but that's all in for, if anybody's interested in those differences, I've kind of gone through those in, in the book, Pharma Customer Experience. I'll, I'll grab the beginning of that one. Um, and it's the, the point I have attempted to make through this presentation, which is listen. You know, if, if you just take a look at the little snippets that we shared you, with you from, from hundreds of hours of, of these conversations that we've built up in, in uh, recent months, what you will hear is very specific guidance on two things. What our customers are looking for in terms of customer experience, and you heard several good comments on that from our, our physicians today, and specifically what they're looking for you to avoid. So Sean makes the right point, which is that the customer experience is happening whether you design it or not. So in order to, to design it appropriately, listen to your customers, find out what they want, what they don't want, and design the program based on those pillars. You know, and, I, and I'll add to that, Heidi, you know, I think two practical things you can do right away is knowing what your distribution of physician personas are, right? So Richard went through those five physician personas that we identified. I'd want to understand what my physician kind of makeup is within those. And then after I know who I'm interacting with, then I'd want to understand how I can deliver an experience for each one of those types of physicians. Um, and making sure that those needs that I identified in those hierarchy of needs are being asked. So making sure when you are listening, you are listening for those key needs that your customers have that will deliver a better experience. Yeah, correct. So I, 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 sort of, I sort of blitzed across that table of the distribution by specialty. In that, in that particular study, we looked at uh, dermatologists, neurologists, and oncologists. And you can saw, even as I blitzed by it, that there were significant differences by specialty. I would point that out and the need to get in touch with the distribution of personas that uh, Sean was just talking about for specialties of interest to you. I would also suggest to you that that's going to change over time. And, and we're going to be, People Metrics is going to be keeping an eye on that because the number of the percentage of digital doctors, for example, is predicted to go up over time. Um, we, need, we need to see the flux and whether new kinds of personas actually uh, wind up emerging as the industry gets more and more into the world of uh, omni-channel marketing. Yeah, and Heidi, I, people might be saying, well, we're already doing a lot of market research. We don't need to do this. This isn't different. I would think, I would rethink that, that the question around, are we, do we really know what our physicians are experiencing on a regular basis? And are we sharing that information with the people interacting with those physicians on a regular basis? So do the sales team know which persona they're calling on? Does, does the medical li liaison know what type of 
what, what kind of needs the physicians basically have right now that they're calling on. There's all of these different questions, I think, when you think about CX. It's sort of a different mindset. It's a subtle shift, but it's, I think it's an important one and, and you know, more to come on this, but that, that would be kind of my final statement that, you know, just think about it sort of from a different point of view and really put yourself in the physician's shoes. And how would you feel if you were being interacted with right now the way they're interacted with by the pharmaceutical companies? Years ago, I was preaching and actually I had uh, the, the author, uh, Seth Godin, come down to, to uh, what was an NPMRG to, to make a presentation on uh, permission marketing. And I, I think that that was an interesting thing to talk about 10 or 15 years ago or whatever the heck it was. But here we are in 2022, and we really need to focus in on getting doctors permission to market to them. And that's what CX Focus is all about. 